Let's talk about another way the Kings can improve. Uh, uh, a defenseman. There is a top four defenseman available. It looks like the NHL is going to clear him to play. The name yeah. is Slava Voina. Arguably yeah. the best, best player in Russia during the Olympics. Um, it seems like the Kings don't want any part of him. So my first, first part of the question is why? Uh, how would fans react if he does come back to the Kings? And if that's completely not an option, what's a fair trade scenario? Um, you know, what's an asset the Kings could get for Slava? Um, he's not coming back to Los Angeles. <laughs> Why not? Because who cares? Sorry, uh, I'm going to jump in and then yeah, I'll, and then I'll jump and then in, I will, please. And I will, I will recuse myself from the conversation. conversation. This to me is the least interesting topic. No offense, Keith. Go. Yeah. <laughs> least, the least interesting conversation yeah. that I constantly see popping up on social media or in the LA Times or in all of these conversations. The last time Slava Voinov played in the NHL was further back, I think, than Kovalchuk, if I'm not mistaken, right? So, no? Right. Kovalchuk, about about no. the same time. But roughly the same amount of time, right? This is a team that won the, the Jennings Trophy as the best defensive team. And Slava Voinov, if he did come back, uh, which I don't particularly want him to, is going to cost so much money that you're going to have to get rid of somebody else. So what you're asking is, is bringing a guy who's going to upset the fans, upset the media, upset the front office, might not be as good as we all remember, and is going to cost you Alec Martinez. What are we even talking about? Yeah. Like, who cares? I think, I think in the, <laughs> Trade him, get some press. I think in this era of Me Too... I don't see any chance of him coming back to any team in the, in the league, quite honestly. I, I can't see it happening. Well, I would disagree with that point. I, there are at least a half a dozen teams, if not closer to 10 teams, that have called and that are interested and, and that will kick the tires on that player because... I can because, see kicking the tires, but that's, gonna be, that's a massive... You're I talking, mean, that's a big-time media problem. You're, you're, you're talking about the right organization, though, in the right market that's going to have to be able to absorb that. And it can be done, uh, I believe. And I, I think that Where? if... Um, Canada? Uh, I, think, I think Toronto. I think Toronto would be one of those markets. Uh, Not with that media. I, I, no, yeah. that, that is a that is a win first media. That's different. That is that is a that is a, a city that will win at all costs. And once the NHL, if the NHL, Gary Bettman approves for him to come back. Uh, I think it's very easy for an organization to come out and say, look, you know, they've done, they, 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 they've done all of the analysis. He's been cleared by the league. He's going to play somewhere. Why not here? But I, I will say, Oof. I don't think he comes back to Los Angeles. Yeah. And I think Jesse actually hit the nail on the head. Where does he fit in at this point? Two years ago, th there was room for Slava Voinov within the salary cap structure. At this point, he was, four, he was at $4 million before. Even if you get him at a discount for $3 million, where are you going to get $3 million to plug him into Los Angeles, and who is he replacing? That's the question. Got and it. I think when you look back at the fact that Rob Blake, over the last year, has put his fingerprints on the organization and has put a roadmap together of where he wants this team to go, and they've added a Brickley. They're going to get Ledoux more playing time this year. Um, FNUF is already here. So where do you fit him in? And I agree with you, Jesse. I don't think that you trade an Alec Martinez or a Jake Muzzin no. for as good as Slava Voinov might be, even M at this, might be. At, might be, even at right. this point, I just think the organization is ready to move on, and it's a year too late, because I will say this, and this goes back to the Me Too movement as well. One year ago, there still was interest in bringing him back to Los Angeles. Me Too hadn't kicked in, but because of the KHL and the way that they wanted to protect the Russian players so they could go to the Olympics, they blocked him from being able to come over here. Uh, if this was a year ago, Slava Voinov, if he was cleared, would have been coming back to the LA yeah. Kings. One year makes a big difference. A couple and, things for me, though. Yeah. Like, he, that player, top four defensemen, is a $5 million player, not a $3 million player. But I He's not going to get market value, though. He may, he may well, not. It depends on the player. Now, yeah. the other thing is, is, I think this came at the top of the pyramid. I don't think ownership wanted him back in Los Angeles. I think it went to that level, and they made a decision that given – all the Me Too new movement, all the negativity around this, plus the distraction to this team. If I'm a general manager, do I have to go into every city and protect this player? No, I want, best deal I can get, I'm gonna call up 10 general managers of the six or whoever's interested. I'm gonna give you 48 hours, give me your best offer, I'll make the deal. I, I would bet everything, the house, that he's not ever gonna play in Los Angeles again. And I think there's a faction in the league in, 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 in ownership and in, in the commissioner's office that don't want him back in the league. I really think that they are frightened of this return because of the public 
uh, negativity around this. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you for just a little bit, though, DB, because yeah. I'm going to tell you, based upon my sources, and I reported this last year, right. uh, Anschutz had signed off. When, yeah. when Blake and, and Robitaille took over, he had signed off on uh, getting Voinov back with the team last year. Last year. I, I can't I comment. I, I know, but I can't yeah. comment on whether he did or did not uh, change because of the Me Too or whatever in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. But I will say, I don't believe that this is an ownership decision at this point. Mm -hmm. I do believe it was Rob Blake that made the decision. From every, all the information I've gathered, it was Blake that has said, you know what, it's time to move forward and I have a different plan, and Slava Voinov is not gonna be involved. So I don't know if the truth will ever come out, but right. I just wanna, I don't, I don't think it was Anschutz. I think this was Blake choosing to move forward. What's a reasonable expectation, Dennis, in terms of a, a, tr a return in, in a trade for Slava Voinov? I would say a second round draft pick. Okay. I think, that's yeah, the I, I think it's more like a third round draft pick. Okay, yeah. so it's low. Uh, eight years ago, in a round table, we talked about how good Ilya Kovalchuk would look on the Los Angeles Kings. In a bizarre turn of events, Ilya Kovalchuk is now part of the Los Angeles Kings. Uh, what do we think about the pickup? What do we think about the contract? What do we think about the term Earl? I mean, it's this reminds me of a Lombardi move where it's feast or famine. I don't think it's going to be anything in the middle. I think he'll either score 30 goals or he'll score nine. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a fan, so I hope he scores 30. But... You know, five years ago when he left, you know, when the Kings won the first cup, they were a slow, plodding, dump and chase team. And now the league's totally changed the speed. And my only concern is, you know, Kopitar's not slow, but he's not exactly a speed burner. Brown is skews towards the slower side. And, you know, Kovalchuk in five years probably has gotten slower. And I just see someone like McDavid licking his chops, going, let me out there against that first line. Uh, well, but you've also got Andre Kopitar, who's the best defensive player in the league on that line. So that, I think that kind of helps a little bit with that. And, oh, you know, for sure. A defenseman. But I, you know, I agree. But I, I love Kovalchuk. I, I've always, always been a huge fan of his. I, well, I used to go to Atlanta just to see him play because he was such a dynamic <laughs> wow, player. Wow, committed. That's cool. Yeah, that's, that's commitment. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, you know, later in his career. But I look at, I look at Yager, and when Yager came back, another, I was another huge fan of his as well. And he came back and played great. And, and from the looks of it, Kovalchuk seems like he's really in great shape. I mean, at least they're putting it out there in the media, they're showing him working out, and Blake and everybody said he's in top tip, top shape. I think he's going to be good. I think he's going to score 30 goals this year. I, I think mean, the issue is not this year. The issue is next year. Yeah. I think this year is going to be fine. He's going to come back this year. He's going to have a chip on his shoulder. He's going to be energized. He's going to be engaged. It's kind of like Phaneuf or many of the right. veterans, whether it's LeCavalier or any of these guys that come to the Kings. Great locker room, great environment, and it pushes those guys to have that initial burst. So for me... We're a year away from really giving the evaluation on, on his contract. He's going to have a great year this year. It's really what happens in year two that's, for me, going to be the more telling story. Yeah, for, from Earl's standpoint, he mentioned that no acquisition cost. Right? Just the, the cap hit is fair, number one. Number two, let's not forget the first line left wing last year scored nine goals. <laughs> right? So that, that's, a, that's a key. I know for a fact that, that when they were looking at Kovalchuk and they sat down with the leadership on the team, their feeling is that if he's 80% of what he was when he left the league at 30 years old, he's going to score 30 goals. If he does that and that, that position is plus 21, then they're going to win the division and they're going to be a threat. And I think that to John's point about next year, I think big picture got to look at this and say, we got to be in all in, in, all in this year. This got to be. This is the opportunistic year, right? It's now. not just this year, though, DB. They mm -hmm. have to be all in for like the next three or four years because that's They're, their window. When yeah. you look at but their I, core, when you look at Quick and Dowdy and Kopitar, yeah. it isn't just this year. It's next year. And I yeah. think the other thing, though, too, it's fine for this year. Mm -hmm. But you do have to look at, well, hold on, what if Kempe played top line left wing yep, and you went out and found another way to fortify the third line? Because what they're looking for this year is they're looking to create a top nine. They don't want a top line. Last year, they were a top line team when Carter was out. When Carter was there, they were a two line team. They want to be a top nine team. Which they have to be. They have to be league. in this league. You to have be a to. Contender. And you look at Agreed. that third line, the way it's constructed right now, which will be Ayafalo on the left side. Uh, you'll have Kempe at center and you'll probably have Gabe Velarde over on the right side. Mm -hmm. And you hope that that's a potent third line. You have some options if, if Velarde's not there. But the point is, you want to have a top nine. If you were to plug in Kempe at the top line left wing, what are you going to do for that center spot? And they know right. that depth down the middle is still important. That has not changed in this league, even with speed. And so you'd have to find that third right. line center, that optimal person. And uh, it, they, they'd rather go plus 21 but on the goal to, but, side. But to me, that's the, that is the key to the Kings. I mean, look, they're going to have the top six is going to be great. They're going to be very good. They're going to they're going to add, you know, Kovalchuk. I mean, I'm assuming he's going to fit in there. You can't move down to the third line. You but could, though, but you but, could. You could move well, him to third line left wing and you could plug Kempe It's very possible, but then who's going to play center? 
You'd have to. Michael Amadio could play center. Somebody could emerge. You could make a trade. You could the, flip the third somebody. line that you ju that you just mentioned: Kempe, Ayafalo, and, and Velardi. Velardi. Mm -hmm. That line there is really interesting to me because they're all young. They all have speed. They all can score. And Velarde, I mean, you know, we'll see. I mean, he, ha he's, he hasn't played a lot of games in junior, but obviously the games he's played, he's been a very dominant player. That, if, if that line clicks, and if they can make that line click, that elevates that team to a potentially a team that could win that division because you need that third line. And that third line looks, from the new NHL, to me, speed, skill, exactly what they need. It's and that's perfect, perfect, well, perfect for the Kings. Let's hold off on, on, on anointing the third line as a thing. Yet. I said if No, no I understand, because we're talking about a second-year player, a rookie, and well, two second Very players great. and a rookie. Right. So uh, who knows? Uh, my concern about Kovalchuk, and I keep hearing oh, this hold repeated. Hold on. What, what do you mean you don't know? What more do you need to see from Adrian Kempe to know that he is a, a solid NHL player and could be a top six player, uh, if not, not a top I'm nine I'm not criticizing player. Kempe's play. I'm just saying before we start talking about them being contenders because of the strength of the third line, I'm just saying we're literally talking about a rookie and two second-year players who didn't play together, right? Like, Kempe's great, but do Kempe and I follow have chemistry? I have no idea. So all I'm saying is, with the, with the Kovalchuk thing, right. I keep hearing people refer to it as a no-cost uh, move, right? They bring him in, it doesn't cost them anything. Mm -hmm. The reality is we live in a salary cap world, and they're pressed up against the salary cap. So acquiring him means, unless the cap goes up $5 million next year, they now have to move somebody by next year's you know, uh, yes, draft. Right. So getting Kovalchuk is going to cost them something. We just don't know what it's going to be yet. And it's entirely possible that what it costs them winds up improving the team again. If they move a guy mm -hmm. in order to make cap space so that they can keep everybody that they want to keep and they, and they bring in a prospect, you know, let's say they have to trade Martinez to, to make cap space and, and the trade winds up bringing them another good prospect, that could still improve the team. But for me, the question is a lot more complicated than just does Kovalchuk work on the top line? Because like I said, it is going to cost him something. I'm less concerned about the second and third year than you are, John, though, because first year, right, I agree with you. I think it's, it's going to work out one way or the other. He's still, even if he's not as good as he used to be, he still puts the fear into defensemen. It's still going to back players off. It's still going to impact the play. I think he'll improve the power play. If the second year is a, a bust, right, if it turns out he's just not great, well, then you actually can buy him out in the third year, and it's only going to cost you only. Three, you know, three million over two 100%. years, but it's a lot less painful than. But they, they had to address the first line left wing, right? So you're saying it, it's. Well, you say this cost, but well, I don't necessarily agree. Well, uh, well the, but, <laughs> but if they, they would have traded. Right? If they didn't, they wouldn't be a contender. Right. You had to address They that were going to make a, a deal contender. for Pacioretty, and it would have probably cost them Muzzin and Anderson Dolan. So it would have cost them Look, more. You can't trade Anderson paid them. Dolan. Five years ago, we sat in a different room and, right. and had a different conversation about different needs for different top line left wingers. Right. They didn't do it. And then they went ahead and won the cup that year. So, and, and six years ago or seven years ago, there was a conversation about them needing to go get a top line left winger. They went and got Dustin Penner, who was, no, hold on. While, and, while a valuable addition to the team, a bust as a top line left winger, and they won the cup mm -hmm. in 2012. Wait, in so I've never bought into this notion that they need a top line left winger. Hold on, no. Right in 2014, mm -hmm. one of the reasons that they were able to, to survive not adding those players is that they had emerging prospects. Toffoli and Pearson were emerging prospects. Are you saying Kempe and I follow aren't emerging prospects? I, I, don't, view, I, don't, I don't view a <laughs> I follow. No, I, I, I don't. I, I never viewed him as a top he's six a player. Third line, I, I, he, he, third line he's a solid third He's a solid third line player. But you need a Johnny Brzezinski to step up. <laughs> well, yes. And this is going to be a make or break year for someone like a Johnny Brzezinski, right? Mm -hmm. But you, mm -hmm. Jared Anderson Dolan is probably still a year away. He's going to push for a job in camp. He wants a job. But there's nothing that tells me that Dolan's, Anderson Dolan's going to make the team this year. But we were literally yeah. just talking about a third line of, of a rookie and two second-year players as being key to them being no, no, no. a contender. With Kovalchuk, so. with Kovalchuk you're, you're arguing that, that perhaps they didn't need to go out and address that. And if they oh, didn't get they did. Kovalchuk and you put Kempe up there, to me, you're just moving chairs around the deck. They right. don't have a solid Kovalchuk third line. Brown had, had career years with this only nine goal scorer on their left wing. Meanwhile, Kempe, who's being heralded as you know the key to the offensive future of the LA Kings, had, what, 16 goals? He had five more goals? Okay. And You're a known Dustin Brown hater. And let's know, go on the I, record and say yeah. Dustin Brown did not have a career year. Dustin Brown returned to being yeah, Dustin no, Brown, anti Daryl Sutton. No, Dustin Brown. He had more points than he had ever scored before in his career. That's which Dustin is the Brown. Generally you, you, look, you look prior. Of you go back year. to 2012 to 2014. <laughs> you look at what he did during the 2013 lockout shortened season and what he was producing. Dustin Brown has produced throughout his career. Yeah, I'm outside not of the last couple of years of Daryl Sutton. I'm saying Ayafalo held his own. Played the clip. He didn't 
not pay Dustin Brown back in the last, former roundtable. <laughs> Didn't want to pay him. Yeah. Yeah. I was right. the last point here. Jesse, you have the last point. I, look, all I'm saying is I think Kovalchuk will work out, but I don't think it's a no. I don't think it's not going to cost them anything. It will cost them something. That could wind up improving the team further, but we have to wait. It's annoying for people to hear, but we have to wait two years to actually evaluate this move.